gentlemen. Are we awake today on a Saturday? Oh, Jim Johnson was the only one to say yes. Okay. How are we doing today? Good. Yeah. Good. Welcome to the UTSA 100K Student Technology Venture Competition. We have nine great teams competing today, combining our business and engineering students, presenting new technologies, business plans, and the opportunity to start new companies. I'm Corey Howell, I'm director of the Center for Innovation and Technology Entrepreneurship, and welcome you here today to this great event, unlike anything else in the UT system. It's going to be a very quick series of presentations today. You've had time to see the projects, to see the products, the potential companies this morning, and now it's time to hear those teams pitch. They're gonna have eight minutes to convince us that they've got a great idea, a great business, and we should invest in them. I'd like to thank the Texas Research and Technology Foundation who sponsors as a primary sponsor for this event. That's the reason we're able to fund these teams, why there's money to give away. I'd also like to thank Cox Smith, uh, which is a law firm here in town who's worked with us, UTSA College of Engineering and Business who support this, the EO organization, the Harvard Business Club of San Antonio, the San, and the San Antonio Technology Center. So the purpose of this competition is to give a vehicle for our seniors in undergraduate engineering and business to get experience at turning their ideas and knowledge into reality. Go to every other university in the UT system, you do a lot of good theoretical work, here you actually translate into real world. That's a big difference. Not only do you graduate with a degree, you graduate with a product, you graduate with a business plan, and potentially your own company. That's a big difference. The awards set up today, we have over $120,000 in startup packages to teams, including the prototype costs, the advisors, cash, office space, legal support to start the companies, and patenting expenses. Also to uh, invite Dr. Leffel, Dr. Allo, and Dr. Johnson to please stand up. These are our distinguished faculty from the College of Engineering, Mechanical, and Electrical, and Dr. Leffel from Business. Uh, without them driving the bullwhip, some of you might not graduate. <laughs> And again, we appreciate your help in making this a reality and the time commitment you put into our student teams to make sure they can succeed. So we have eight minutes to present. We'll take two questions per team. So we'll rotate between judges as we go through each one. This is going to be the order of the presentation. I hope everything you have is ready up here. At the end of the presentations, in real time, I'll be collecting the data sheets. We'll be compiling the scores. We'll sequester with the judges, look at the scores, and we'll come back within 20 minutes to make the awards. We're going to have best pitch, best business plan, and best overall technology venture. Those are the three places. Uh, I'd like you to meet our judges. If you don't mind, I'll call your name. Please stand up for a second. Uh, we're going to have Chris Hochart from Red Wagon Realty, who's here a UTSA alum and founder of several businesses. Derek Pizarro with Cox Smith, UTSA alum, engineer and lawyer working on high-tech companies, startups, securities. We have James Brem from Compass Intelligence, who's here today, who works in this space. Uh, we have, uh, make sure I'm in the right order here, Neil Kellen, sorry, from Compass Inc., uh, Concert Inc., uh, who also has a, uh, a significant interest in several of the technologies we saw here today, uh, and we'll have some advice for you later. We have uh, Nicole Gwinner from Jackson Walker, who works in securities and IP. We have Rudy De La Garza from the Idea Finishing School, First Dominion Financial and Pre-Corporation. Uh, and we have Mike Fry from University of Incarnate Word and part of I IEEE chapter here in San Antonio. So again, thank you to our judges who've taken the time to be here today. Uh, and and a reminder, this is not an academic event. 
Our judges have the ability to give you advice, to connect with you. Some have even invested in past companies. The intent is this is a real launch, we're going to be real about it, and we're going to see how far some of these technologies can go. I'm quickly going to ask um, Bill Tolhurst to come up, who's the head of the Harvard Business Club of San Antonio. Bill, if you don't mind coming up for a second. Bill coordinates our mentor program, and we have some of our mentors here today, and I wanted to definitely recognize them for the hard work they do of bring a real-world advising experience to these young teams. So, Bill? Great. Thank you, Corey. Um, let me ask all of the uh, mentors, the uh, current semester or anyone from past semesters, please to stand. All right, uh, so uh, as uh, all of you who are uh, the student teams know, uh, our goal here uh, now in our sixth semester of offering this with, uh, with Corey and Anita and uh, the folks from the engineering school is to have folks uh, that you see here to be able to bring their expertise to the teams, uh, their real world experiences. And so I'd like to offer and give them a hand for their hard work this semester. Uh, and afterwards, we're actually going to mentor a picture with Bill uh, for one of the press releases we're going to do, so if you wouldn't mind sticking around. So as we kick things off, Dr. Leffel is going to be our timekeeper down here. She will give you the one minute and the half minute, and at eight minutes, you will be cut off. So the first team we're going to have up is PCMR. You're actually going to need to use that because you're being recorded. PCM on Medical. We are a nonprofit social enterprise chosen to work in sub Saharan Africa to reduce the risk of death in expecting mothers. Every minute, there's a woman that dies in. Every minute a woman dies due to complications of childbirth. This is every minute worldwide, and 529,000 deaths occur per year because of this. Um, specifically, 50% of those deaths are in Sub-Saharan Africa, and they have a 1 in 16 chance of dying in this region. The leading cause of death is hemorrhaging, mostly caused by undiagnosed, undiagnosed anemia. 95% of all medical devices in this region are impractical because impractical they don't meet the underlying needs of this region or they are way too complicated for them to use. 50% of all medical devices here are outdated or non-functional. They need cost-effective, easy-to-use devices in their healthcare facilities in order to administer proper care. So the solution to this is our product, the Hemolock. Our product measures blood clotting factors which is vital for monitoring women prenatal and post-labor. How it works is you insert the blood into our disposable cartridge and the cartridge is placed into the hemolog. From there, a series of instrumentations happen and it gives a graphic reading. Doctors can use this graphic reading to determine and identify specific blood diseases like anemia, hypercoagulation, and Hughes syndrome. So, our competition. First, we have the Biosense Touch HB, which costs $10,000 and it only tests for anemia. Next is the chemo Q201. It's $800 and it tests for blood glucose levels, anemia, and, bloody, and blood clotting time. And then we have our product, the Hemolog, which in our first year will cost $700. And it tests for anemia, blood clotting time, and blood clotting factor. And it's the factor that really determines it um, in aiding diagnosing blood diseases. So our product is unique because of our low cost and our market focus in Sub-Saharan Africa. Currently, our competitors are not in Africa, and we feel this is where our product is most needed. So we will be the first to break into this region. A woman in Sub-Saharan Sub Africa has a 1 in 16 chance of dying due to complications of birth, compared to a developed nation where they have a 1 in 5,600 chance of dying. So we will be focusing on five countries, Nigeria, Tanzania, 
Democratic Republic of the Congo, Sudan, and Uganda. And we have picked these countries because of their high maternal mortality rate, the number of healthcare facilities they have, and um, the amount of funding provided to them through UNICEF, UNFPA, and USAID. <laughs> So one of the biggest challenges our organization is going to face is actually the distribution of the product. So we will be selling the hemolog and the cartridges to larger aid organizations who have the necessary distribution lines in place to deliver these to those healthcare facilities in our five target markets. So our customers consist of UNICEF, UNSPA, and USAID. And this is because all these organizations are pushing to achieve Millennium Development Goal number five. MDG5 was set in 1990 by the World Health Organization and it was to reduce maternal mortality ratios worldwide by 75% by the year 2015. However, many other regions have seen a substantial improvement, but the sub-Saharan region is lagging behind, so there's been an increased reinvestment in this area. So last year alone, UNICEF procured about $1.9 billion worth of supplies and equipment. Of this, 55% of it went to the sub-Saharan region, totaling about a billion dollars in assistance. Also, UNFPA procured about $365 million worth of assistance. Of that, 37% of it went to the Sub-Saharan region, totaling about $135 million in assistance. And lastly is USAID. Last year, they, they had gave about $6.4 billion in assistance to 49 countries throughout the Sub-Saharan region. Of this, 23% of it went to our five target countries, which is about $1.5 billion in assistance. So with that being said, there's four major risks that we see when implementing and selling our product. And the first of these is that we do not meet supplier standards for UNICEF, UNFPA, and USAID. And to do this, we have to get regulatory approval through the FDA, and we also have to contract out with ISO certified manufacturers. After that, once we actually enter the market, we see a problem with the use of it in these regions. The first is that the power supply is not always stable. So we'll have to build in some, char some sort of charging device that will allow it to be used in case of power outages or if it's being used in a remote area. And lastly, well, the second thing with that is the disposable of the, the, the cartridges. Cartridges in this region are contaminated material. Once used, the cartridge is contaminated. And the disposal method over there is to burn all this contaminated material. So that we don't hurt the people or the environment, we'll have to make the cartridges out of the non-toxic material. And lastly is the threat of competition entering the market. As we grow, we don't only want to sell one product. We'll add additional products so our sales revenue is not solely dependent on the hemolog. So the last thing I want to talk about today is the financials and how we came to these assumptions. So when we were looking in the market, we, we noted that there was another organization that was just like us, and their name is Design Revolution. And we really mirrored our financials off of that and how they raised their money. So we determined that in our first year, we could raise about $100,000 in grant money. But after that, we really want to get away from grants and try and sustain the business off of sales and donations. So, and with additional 100,000, with that 100,000 dollars, we believe we can raise an additional 180,000 from donations, 100,000 from our, our founding members and our mentor, and then 80 outside of that. And we determined by looking again at Design Revolution that we could probably see 11.2 percent increase in donations every year thereafter. The last thing I want to talk about is the sales. We cannot begin sales to year two because we have to get regulatory approval. But in that second year, when we begin sales, we feel we can move about 250 hemologs and 168,000 cartridges. The hemolog will be sold at cost to our customers, and as we grow, we can scale this down. So in our first year, we believe it will be about $700, but as we grow, we believe we can get the cost down to about 500. But where we're really going to make our money is on the cartridges. The cartridges will be sold for 60 cents, and they cost us about 35 cents to manufacture, providing a 25 cent margin. And every year, as we sell more hemologs, we'll, our cartridges will grow exponentially. That's because we're not only providing cartridges for those units that we have now that we sold this year, but all those that we, we sold last year. So at the end of year two, we're projecting to see about $267,000 in sales. And by year three, we're projecting to see about $67,000 in net revenue. And by year five, we're planning to see about $270,000 in net revenue. And just in the time of this presentation, seven women have lost their lives due to complications of childbirth. So donate today to help save lives. Thank you. We have one mic, so I'm going to ask uh, judges, we can take two questions, uh, and you will have to speak a little loud. Can you do a steam up here, please? Yes. Mike. Yes. Uh, my question is this. Since you're dealing with a uh, medical product, uh, is it kind of too
two questions. Uh, how are you managing quality assurance of the product? What, what's your plan Ooh, with that? That's and the next, the next thing, how will you handle a recall? Well, that was, that's why we have to contract out with ISO certified manufacturers. That's because they have to have those quality management systems in place to pretty much ensure that your product is being produced similarly. So, and if we have a recall, we we really believe that this product is, the, it's very simple in design, so it won't be, be hard to manufacture. However, if we do have a recall, we really, we're thinking about putting a, uh, an exchange program in place to where we'll actually give you a whole new unit. Great. Thank you very much. The next team we have is Mesa. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Brian Mundy, and on behalf of BB Industries, I would like to talk to you today about the MESA, the Multi-Purpose Excavator and Skid Loader Adapter. <clears throat> Nearly every construction company has a use for an excavator and or skid loader because of its attachments. On the right-hand side of the screen, to the lower right, you will see an excavator with a uh, digging bucket attached to it. On the top, you will see a skid loader with a larger bucket attached to it. <clears throat> Excavators and skid loaders are commonly used for material handling, digging, demolition, and landscaping. As a matter of fact, there's a high probability that the very room we're sitting in today was completed with the use of an excavator and a skid loader. <clears throat> the Mesa is an adapter that allows skid loader attachments to be used with an excavator. Currently, the problem is that skid loader attachments cannot, uh, cannot go on to an excavator. Now, small businesses, in order to uh, remain competitive in the market, have to be very versatile and have to have efficiency on the job site. Now, this requires a lot of resources, time, money, and manpower. Having to move all this equipment, putting it on trucks, paying for gas, hiring employees to operate two different machines, takes a lot of time and money. b and Industries is here to help. With the introduction of the Mesa, which is a universal adapter made of solid steel, we are able to help construction companies with their problems and, re re and alleviate them and help with, the resource, help with their resource needs which includes time management. They'll have less equipment on the job site, and in some cases, they may not even need the skid loader at all. They have increased value with an excavator that can have the attachments from the skid loader because the excavator can move farther and move higher and uh, carry more weight than a skid loader can. <clears throat> Almost every construction project requires some kind of excavation work. Therefore, the MESA fits into diff these different sectors of the construction industry. 
as you can see, 50% of it is earth moving, excavation, land clearing, and trench digging. Our target market that we would like to focus on first and foremost is a small business, the little guy. The guy that uh, necessarily doesn't have the resources to go out and buy a $100,000 excavator as well as going out and buying a $50,000 $50, skid loader. However, he can go and get the attachments and with the use of the Mesa, attach them onto the excavator. Some of these companies would include land and brush clearing companies, septic installation companies, and general con uh, construction companies. Our next avenue that we would like to target is distributors. Two, two distributors uh, specifically that we've contacted are Buffmark um, Equipment and USA Attachments. Now both of these companies have shown a great interest in the Mesa and have, have uh, wanted to know when it will be out on the market and how they can get their hands on it. Lastly, we'd like to focus on rental companies. Two companies specifically that we've targeted are Nash, Nationals Rent and Hertz Rental. Now these companies work with construction uh, companies and employees on a daily basis, so they know the needs of the market. They know what, what, uh, their, uh, what their customers are renting. They have had a huge interest in the Mesa and are very excited to see it come to light. Our sales strategy is pretty simple. We'll start here in San Antonio, and like I said, we'll base it off of the three, three main uh, uh, targets, small business being one, rental companies, and attachment distributors. Now with B&E Industries, we really want to get out there into the market and have a hands-on approach with the Mesa. We want our customers to be able to understand it, ask us questions, see it work, watch it get dirty, and just really um, understand it so that way they have a, a, a great knowledge about the product. Next, we'll move to our online sales strategy in which we'll build a website. Now on this website, we'll have how-to videos and testimonials, which will include feedback, and this will also help with potential customers so they can go online and, and see these videos. Lastly, we've targeted trade shows and magazines. Two trade shows specifically in 2013, AGC Texas Trade and Equipment Show in Austin, Texas, and the, ICU, uh, and the ICUEE in Louisville, Kentucky. Our competition, there's only one known competitor on the market. However, the Mesa, as you can see, has two distinct differences from the hookup. One of those being the price, and the other being the weight. The Mesa has a cost of 55% less than the hookup. And the Mesa is 66% lighter than the hookup. As well, the Mesa is very sim simple. A lot of simplicity as opposed to the hookup. And it is customizable. Where we started and where we're at now, as you can see, everything with a check mark has been completed to date. We do have a fully complete scale model, which is in use today. As a matter of fact, as soon as this competition's over, it's going back out in the field and it's going to get dirty and it's going to be put back to work. Stability tests have been tested on the Mesa and, and passed. We have created buzz about the Mesa through emails and telephone calls, and we do have a customer base. <clears throat> Our future plans, we intend to apply for a patent. Upon completion of that, we'd like to secure the proper funding for startup to ensure that we have funding for the first year so we can get the Mesa out into the market and really start to mass produce it. Once we have that in place, then we'll be able to set up our warehouse, our manufacturing, and our company SOPs. Now we have assessed some risks, but we do have solutions to those risks. Some of the risks that we've looked at are no market penetration. The solution that we can combat that with is the implement, implement, we can implement new marketing strategies. Another risk is increased competition. But we feel at B&E Industries that our solution to that is our customization and our R&D, as well as our feedback and having a one-on-one -on -one approach, hands-on feel with our customers. Our advisory board, Natasha Argulello, Lee Coggins, Dr. James Johnson, engineering mentor and professor, Dr. Anita Leffel, uh, business professor and mentor, David Zinsmeister, owner of Zinsmeister Construction, who is our first customer and who is actively using the Mesa today, and Hans Hobda, owner of Hobda Farms. Taking a look at our financials here, you can see that our total expenses for the first year run at $65,000. 
uh, $600. Now we've estimated our total sales for the first year to be at 50 units. We've based this number off of our call reports in which we've conducted over 100 different call reports to individuals and companies in the market. Over half of them have expressed a great, great interest in the MESA. With that, we, with that we'll have $56,000 uh, with that, we'll have $56,000 worth of sale for the first year, and we'll break even at 142 units beginning of year three. Our initial investment is $100,000. There's three different avenues in which we're looking to obtain this money, in which we can discuss further. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time, and I just want you to remember, on behalf of b and &E Industries, big or small, the Mesa does it all. to do that um, and you know we're going to get out there and really kind of put you know boots on the ground and, and get our hands dirty so um, basically what um, through our research we'll, we'll see but we do definitely anticipate on, on 50 units um, based off our call reports we feel that that's a, a safe number uh, it's a it's a it's a number that's obtainable market with endless growth potential. Now imagine the opportunity to be a part of a company in a $60.2 billion medical device industry. Last, imagine, imagine taking advantage of that opportunity right here and right now. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen, we are Enhanced CPM Technology. My name is Lakeisha Pitts and I'm the Marketing Specialist and this is Michael Craven, our CEO. And we have designed a refined and enhanced CPM device for the knee. So continuous passive motion, or CPM device as it is commonly referred to, is prescribed to patients immediately following most knee surgeries, with the most commonly being used for total knee replacements. As the video shows, the device oscillates the knee back and forth along a prescribed range of motion for a certain duration of time to prevent immobilization. This reduces pain and swelling and prevents the formation of scar tissue around the knee joint, all of which contributes to a faster recovery process for the patient. Currently, there are more than 25 million Americans with osteoarthritis, and it's estimated that more than 12 and a half million, more than half, will need a total knee replacement and thus the use of a CPM device. Our research shows that devices currently on the market are difficult to transport because they're heavy, uncomfortable for patients because they're bulky, and last but not least, they're expensive. So what's the solution? The ECT300 
It's lightweight weighing in at only 11 pounds compared to the market average of 25 pounds, which makes it easier for the patient to transport in their homes, which is important, especially following knee surgery. The device is also with adjustable, providing a benefit to the patient's leg and increasing patient comfort. This same feature allows the device to be more compact for shipping and storage purposes, which allows us to sell it to, which allows us to sell our product at a lesser cost to medical distributors. As I mentioned to you earlier, the medical device manufacturing industry is a $60.2 billion industry, and medical distributors, our target market, account for 25% of the industry revenue. There are about 11,000 in the U.S., and we estimate that there are 1 to 2,000 specialty orthopedic device distributors that we could be t potentially sell our product to. Now, market trends show that there's an opportunity for tremendous growth in demand for our product. The elderly population, those who are 65 years and older, account for 13% of the entire population. And according to the graph from the U.S. Census, the elderly population is expected to double within the course of 30 years. And as we all know, baby boomers are placing a strain on the healthcare industry, creating a tremendous demand for medical services and products like ours. Of the 700,000 total new replacements performed in 2009, those 65 and older accounted for 54% of those surgeries, while the younger generation represented or accounted for the remaining 46%. According to the graph from the National Center for Health Statistics, there has been a 20% increase in the rate of total new replacements among those those 65 years and older, so we can assume that there will also be a 20% increase in the demand for new CPM devices as well. This graph illustrates the potential market size for new CPM devices. And currently it is a small market, but we can expect it to double within the course of five years. And overall, I'll see a 400% increase within the course of just 20 years. So the time to enter the market would definitely be now. How are we gonna meet this demand? Enhanced CPM Technologies will hire an experienced sales staff that will then, in turn, sell directly to medical distributors. <clears throat> the medical distributor then provides the end user with our product, usually paid for by insurance uh, through rentals. As Kesey said earlier, our target market are those 1 to 2,000 specialty orthopedic device distributors. Our initial marketing efforts will be concentrated in Florida, Texas, and California, as these states have the highest elderly population. We've already identified several potential customers, the most promis promising of which has been OrthoPlus. OrthoPlus carries about 800 CPMs, excuse me, carries about 800 CPM devices uh, in stock and purchases upwards of 100 CPMs per year. We met with the Vice President of OrthoPlus who validated the potential of our product and showed great interest in the ECT300 due to its low cost. Our competitive matrix shows that the ECT300 is a superior product. It's less than half the weight of the market average, weighing in at 11 pounds. It's width adjustable, the only product on the market that's width adjustable, and it's low cost, all of which will aid us in penetrating the market as well as, make our, make, as well as making our product more appealing to distributors by increasing their bottom line. We require an initial outlay of $250,000, and we want investors that can help us take this company to the next level. This $250,000 investment will get you 10% of the company and will pay for FDA hurdles, the first 150 units produced, as well as sales team salaries and research and development for the first year. Our break-even point is expected at about two and a half years after our first sale. We've identified the top two risks associated with the development of our product, and the first is FDA approval. However, there are several similar devices that have already passed through the FDA process, therefore exempting our product from the 510K application and reducing costs and time associated with the FDA process. We estimate that uh, it'll take a year to a year and a half to get through the FDA completely. Uh, the second risk, is our competitive advantage sustainable? <laughs> is our competitive advantage sustainable? Due to our product's low weight and width adjustability, it's safe to say that we have a patentable product here today. Our exit strategy is to become acquired by Chattanooga or Autobach, one of the major medical device manufacturers located in the United States. Our key partners include Dustin MacArthur, our mentor with various medical supply connections, David Ray, uh, regional sales manager of Massimo Incorporated, Dr. Prospero Hernandez, an orthopedic surgeon and uh, potential distributor and investor located in Mexico, 
as well as Santiago, Dr. Santiago Avalos, a hospital owner and potential investor also located in Mexico. Are there any questions? Due to our market research, we determined that a completed product uh, in a medical device industry uh, ended up being about $2.5 million. A completed product with or without revenue stream? Uh, I guess you got me there. You got to start somewhere. <laughs> Next part. Derek? Yeah, so you had five or six competitors there, all about the same weight, the same price point. Are you missing features that they have? Why, why is there such a big differential? And are you, you know, are missing things that you want to argue that you should have? Or why are you back at this? Is there anything? Sure. I'm glad you asked that question. I'm really excited that you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> The design team spent a lot of time and a lot of effort looking at how the human body works. Not only did we look at how the human body works, we looked at how each one of these manufacturers designed their machine. We picked it apart piece by piece. I'm talking down to the fasteners. We designed our product to achieve transportation efficiency, ergonomic factors, increased embryonic factors, and increased range of motion precision. And we believe it does that, as well as support the process of continuous passive motion therapy. We didn't change the therapy. We didn't change the way it was done. We just changed the way the device is designed and implemented into the process. You still get the same result. Now I'm gonna say, redesign is in our budget plan. We do wanna look at things to make this even better. But thank you. Thank you. Next will be life management systems. It's not open. Oh, it's not open. Okay. It's on the desktop. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming today. My name is Alex Huth, and I'm here representing Life Management Systems. Life Management Systems is a company dedicated to selling low, easily replicable home automation systems to attract home builders that provides increased potential value to their homes for a low marginal cost. We're seeking $200,000 for 25% equity. Many of you may not know what home automation is exactly. Um, as you've seen outside, home automation allows from a single point of control to control everything in your house from lights to temperature, security, locks, even home theater applications. Builders need to very much so pay attention to this new emerging technology. Currently, the, home, the home, new home construction industry is doing horribly. It's at the lowest point it's been in the last 10 years, down 75% in sales from 2005. Average home builders are looking at negative 3% net revenues annually, with large home builders like KB Homes and Pult experiencing only about a maximum 4% net earnings each year. Uh, this is a struggling market that is experiencing many people collapsing, uh, many firms falling apart. Home automation has been proven in numerous locations to reduce sales cycles of new homes, create larger profit margins, and higher perceived value for every single home. With our technology and with our devices, home builders can expect $20,000 increased perceived value of each home for $7,500, or an actual marginal cost of what they're currently doing of $6,000. Now. How are we going to achieve this? Primarily selling to developers. We can really uh, capitalize on the reduced marginal cost by entering during the build phase. Uh, many, home builder, uh, many home automation systems try and enter at the remodel phase, but by entering at the build phase, you can drastically reduce costs and reduce the duplicative costs of components and labor. We intend to sell directly in bulk to those builders, um, utilizing economies of scale along with selling our product. We are spe also specialize in low-cost partners. 
Many home automation firms traditionally use a single high cost partner. However, we have the flexibility to work with numerous lower cost competitors. Uh, that allows us to give a similar quality product but make sure that we have a low, low cost product to sell. Also, our software is easy to duplicate and by using and working with uh, large, uh, large home builders, uh, tracked home builders traditionally, we can use customize our software only five or six different floor plans and not have to customize it every single time to different homes. Now, the market potential is essentially about to explode. Home automation has paralleling cell phone growth from 1990 to 2004. It's basically following Moore's law. They've experienced over 60% compound annual growth each year from 2007 to 2011. And ABI Research, a market research firm that specializes in home automation system, expects 50 of the market to grow more than 50-fold. This is a huge market that people need to be begin paying attention to and the time to enter it is now. Our, additional, our initial target market will be San Antonio and Austin and the surrounding outlying areas. That represents about 62 builders that built a, a little bit under 13,000 homes in 2011. 2% 2 penetration that rep into that market with our current model represents a little bit under 2 million in revenue. In the United States, there's 8,400 builders constructed about 337,000 homes in 2011 in our price range. Uh, that 2% penetration of that market is a little bit over 50 million in revenue. This represents a total potential market of 2.5 billion in a housing market that's the worst it's been in decades. To reach these customers, we depend on two things, relationships and publicity. First and foremost is personal contact by our sales team, which will initially consist of the founders. Uh, reaching out to them, calls, hounding them. Um, currently, one of our, uh, one of our uh, founders, Robert Baffey, has been in contact with KB Homes and numerous other local small, uh, small home construction firms. Uh, we're already starting to receive feedback on how to modify our product. We also intend to attend networking events uh, such as professional groups and meetings that these, that these home builders attend and really get to know them, work with them, and maximize our product to their needs. We also tend to generate publicity through trade shows and local, local trade shows specifically to each market area that we work in, such as the San Antonio Home Builder Show and the Home and Garden Show. We also intend to establish social proof primarily through either developing a demo home or entering at or low cost with a very small developer to show concretely that our product does reduce sales cycles, increase perceived value, and generally make selling homes significantly easier. Our growth plan is to start in San Antonio, Austin, and the surrounding areas for years one and two, and in years three and four, expand to, Sa uh, to Dallas and Houston. In years five, we'll begin to look nationally and see what we can expand to. This growth plan is, uh, is, follows up very well with expectations for recovery of the new home construction market, which is expected to recover from the bubble in around 2017. Texas, San Antonio, and Austin specifically has been one of the stable, most stable new home sales markets, which is why we feel very comfortable entering here. Our sales projections are as follows. There's approximately 100 homes per neighborhood, so we can generally estimate our sales in terms of the number of neighborhoods we want to sell. Year one is about 26. We only really are looking to sell a couple of homes as we really maximize and optimize our business model. Year two, we expect to sell about an entire neighborhood's worth of systems. Uh, this will allow us a little bit under a million in revenue. Year three is when we start to pick up our pace and start expanding to different locales within Texas. This will generate probably about three million in revenue, representing about four, four homes sold, and our explosive growth becomes in year four and five, where we expect to generate a little bit over six million in year four and about 12 million in year five, selling about 17 neighborhoods in year five. And our profit, we expect to, of course, be in, the, be in the red in year one. However, we expect sales to pick up in year two and by break even by year three, generating about 380,000 380, in net, net earnings. By year five, we expect to generate about two, a little bit over two million in net earnings. Now, if our year one valuation is $800,000, we expect our year value, five valuation to be 21.65 million, accounting for our valuation at 10 times net earnings. This represents a 27 times return on investment for our investment partners. If we were going to be acquired, uh, we expect it to be either through a competing home automation firm or with uh, a home builder looking to just completely integrate this into their model. This is, wouldn't be possible without our excellent advising team. Paul Martin is the owner and chief partner of Martin Capital Advisors, an entrepreneurial uh, a firm he's created in town. Uh, his portfolio has returned over 740% over the last 20 years. Uh, John Hyland is the former president and CEO of Pepsi Cola International's largest franchise, Hemex. He's a serial entrepreneur and current COO of BioVideo, a startup in town. 
Diane Huth is the former VP of Marketing at Mission Foods and has been a director level market, uh, director of level marketing uh, at many Fortune 500 companies. And she is also the CMO of BioVideo. And lastly, Frank Baffey has been 20 years as director and VP at large technology firms such as AMD and Sirius Logic. Uh, and he's accounted for over 1.5 billion in revenue uh, for his, in, over his career. These people have provided innumerable and, and excellent experiences to help us grow and are really setting us up to succeed in the future. Like management systems, we're low cost home automation systems for builders to provide, give them a competitive advantage to succeed in the market. We're seeking $200,000 for 25% equity. This is our contact information. We hope to hear from you soon. Thank you so much. I can answer the first one, I can pass the second one to you. Um, primarily um, for the management and maintenance of the device, initially when the, when the unit is sold with the home, we intend to package a, a, a warranty for the same value as the Tracked Home Builder offers. So KB Homes traditionally offers a warranty of varying lengths, whatever the length of their home, or, or you know, whatever, depending on the type of the home. We expect to offer a similar warranty package along with the device and offer extended warranties that added additional cost to the home builder after that time. Um, after the time, if they don't expect, intend to extend it, then the, I mean, it becomes like your plumbing system. It's something you have to maintain if you want to reap the benefits of it. Um, and then for the software updates? Uh, with respect to the software updates, I would say that uh, since right now we're, we have an Android-based platform and it's going to be moving to the, the iPhone market as well, um, being uh, that it's a mobile application, it's going to have constant updates and everything. So we're going to have to be constantly working on it because there's going to be new subsystems that can be integrated. So we're going to need to, just by definition, have to update it frequently. How is the homeowner going to know this? A notification from the Android market? I don't know. <laughs> Chris, you have one question? Yeah, so according to your business plan, your business plan selling the actual product, the light switches, the lines, mm -hmm. all that. But you're not actually creating those products, you are a reseller of those products, correct? Yes. So you're actually selling a software integration system for those products that exist on the market today, right? Correct. Okay. So effectively, we're just selling technology. You're not servicing any of the manufactured parts. You're just servicing the technology for the integration of those manufacturers. Correct? Yes, generally. What we want to do is we want to provide a solution. People don't want to buy components necessarily. They want to buy an entire system that works. And we want to provide the part that integrates all of those components and that is a, a simple, ubiquitous, single point of control for everything in the home. Okay, so you're the glue that fills in the middle. Yes. So at that point, you're making your money on infrastructure, and I think that your numbers need to be revamped to indicate that you're the glue in the middle of the infrastructure that keeps all the other I think you need to revamp those numbers so that we can see what a real cost projection and a profit projection looks like off of your actual product, not the components that are a part of it. Okay. Make sense? Yes. And I think you got a great product here. I think it's fantastic. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Vasquez, and I'm part of Revamp Technologies. 
Today I'm excited to be talking to you about our award-winning product, ABTS, and how it will improve the, over, uh, the success rate of the Amber Alert program. As of 2003, all states were required to adopt a program to aid in the recovery of abducted victims. Thus, all states implemented the Amber Alert program. The current problem with the Amber Alert program is that it is very costly. It can also take up to 12 hours to be issued after an abduction is reported, which, makes, which virtually makes this program ineffective, resulting in a mere 16% success rate for the year 2010. And currently, uh, license plate recognition software on patrol vehicles uh, are limited to the user, um, to the user area and uh, the area and use of the driver. What we are offering is the Automated Vehicle Tracking System, or just simply AVTS, which is a software that will transmit a license plate uh, image into data and, and store it into a searchable database that can be accessed by an uh, authorized law enforcement official. Um, uh, and we, 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 plan to, we plan to offer a low-cost product by, existing, uh, by exploiting existing technology within the states. How does the AVTS process work? New and existing cameras will co consistently capture images of, uh, of vehicles entering state highways. Then from those images, they will be transferred into data and then transmitted into a searchable database. When an Amber Alert is issued, an authorized law enforcement official will be able to access this database and, <coughs> and uh, locating a vehicle in question and then potentially leading to the apprehension of the criminal. Data transmission. When the image is taken, we will take an image of the actual vehicle. Then the license plate will be isolated and the numbers will be broken down and that data will be transferred into our database as shown on the timeline right here. After speaking with Officer Brian Feltz of the San Antonio Police Department, he informed us that our program could would be seen as a highly valuable investment if, we, if it could enhance the overall success rate of the Amber Alert program. He directed us to the state level Department of Information Resources with our primary contact being the Chief Technology Officer and that they are in control of the state's technological budget. The license plate recognition industry is a relatively new industry, but it is expanding exponentially. There is a projected growth of 30% over the next two years, and thus by the year 2014, total revenue within the industry would be around $580 million. <coughs> With the projected growth and the, over the next, uh, with the 30% projected growth over the next two years, there's a lot of competition within our industry. Our two major competitors, LSAG and NDI Recognition, lack in three areas that we deem as our competitive advantage. We will be offering GPS real-time location tracking. We will also offer license. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, our our system will be customized for user needs, and uh, we will offer 24/7 uh, uh, IT support. Currently, a camera with, uh, with LPR technology in it already costs on average about $3,000 per unit. We will be licensing out our software for $250,000 annually, which would equate to a mere 83 of all alternative cameras. We will also, we also, we also, <coughs> we anticipate a few potential risks with our product, one risk being camera accuracy. For this, we will have our product go through rigorous testing to match our software with the most cost-efficient camera out on the market now. There's also a concern for the diluted human element in law enforcement through camera monitoring, but we will mitigate this concern by just, we will mitigate this concern by, we will mitigate this concern because it is a uh, program to aid in existing technology. Also, uh, another concern would be the L LPR uh, competitors and substitutes within the industry. But what we are doing is enhancing the overall, uh, overall success rate of the Amber Alert program. Also, our last, our last concern that we see is our product, uh, our camera is not being compatible with our software. So it was important for us to find a low-cost camera, which we priced at $160, to match up with our, uh, with our software. Our, our, uh, our sales, our marketing strategy will consist of creating relationships with chief, the chief technology officers so that we may arrange meetings and set up product demonstrations. Upon adoption of our program, we will consider several funding options, which will include state and federal budgets, the state technological budget, and uh, organizational funding. The distribution process will, cons will consist of an order, uh, an order being placed, 
then manufactured, sent back to revamp tech so that we may inspect it, and then sent out to be installed, and then finally implementation, and then ongoing IT support. Our revenue model entails us licensing out our software annually for $250,000. We will also, uh, we, will also um, we will also have IT professional fees for each state, depending on, depending on how many they need. We will also have optional leasing of our servers and equipment, and also addition, additional cameras for any state that needs to have any other cameras installed. <coughs> for our startup funding, to cover operating expenses such as research and development, marketing expense, our salaries, we are requiring $400,000. With, with an initial owner investment of $100,000, we are requesting $300,000 for a 20% equity in our company. Any questions? success rate we can uh, we can provide as far as improving the success rate of the, of the Amber Alert. Yeah. I'm still uh, questioning is the camera, is it device agnostic, is it going to connect it to existing devices out there, is it a platform uh, for storing time, uh, time series data or you know is it licensed to play record? You listed a lot of things there. Could you repeat some of those things? Exactly. I'm well, sorry. one of the things was camera. You said we're going to have to partner our software with a camera. Yes. So is it, or is this device encountered? Is it a business plan that said it would be able to, to attach to existing cameras that are out there? Um, is this a, just a platform, right? The management platform. Is it a database for storing time series data? Because these transactions are going to be in time series. Very difficult to do and, and search, um, considering there's 130 million vehicles around the United States. So, I mean, it's, that's going to be very complex. Or is this just truly license plate recognition and on the cheap? It's a little bit of all of the above, but uh, mainly it's the database we would be selling. Database is a main selling point. And I, I believe your question about you asking if it was attachable to existing cameras. That could be done, yes, sir. Yeah, um, the cameras, like you said, a lot of people have brought it up today, the red light cameras, you know, that could be integrated with those potentially, yes, sir. And like you said, it is overall a big database. It could be searchable by time. Eventually, once we get enough, um, I would say everybody's saying, you know, we need to have enough space, we need to have enough server space. And so we would start out, and eventually we would need to have a lot of server space for potentially if we did San Antonio first, and then we branched out to a greater region of Texas. <laughs> and so forth all the way through. Um, if it is attachable, how? Right, to existing cameras. You know, because each of those are operated in their own wire. Sure. Um, I mean, they're attachable now somehow to, you know, how does your car, when you drive through it, right, get to a uh, police station? So we would, I guess we could break it down and go through that and see how they do it. And once they do it, we could reverse engineer it and make it our own way. If that makes sense, does that make sense, sir? Good. Thank you very much. The next thing will be renewable revolution.
Hello everyone, my name is Sherry Sauter and I'm the CFO of Renewable Revolution. <laughs> now the looming energy crisis is a top priority for this country and a small business can spend upwards of $12,000 a year on utilities. These same businesses can gain negative perception from their customers because of their inability to afford some of these uh, high initial investments associated with greener energy practices. There's also additional pressure from the government with the enactment of the Energy, Independence, and Security Act of 2007. This is a push for businesses to generate as much electricity as they consume by 2025, among other stipulations. Uh, the problem is, this is to uh, push our country to lessen its dependence on foreign oil, which accounted for $406 billion last year in, s in federal subsidies. The problem is finding an alternative energy source that doesn't require a high initial investment, will help businesses save on their energy costs, and promote a green image for the firm while complying with the government. Our solution to this is the Kineta Plate. The Kineta Plate is a device that generates electricity as a vehicle runs over it. It will help businesses cut down on high energy costs, promote a green image for their firm, and be in compliance with the government. It will do this by supplementing existing power sources such as from CPS. All right, this is an animation illustrating how the original design of the Kineta plate works. As you can see, it needs to be installed in the ground, and as the, top wheel, as the wheel runs over the top plate, it deflects. This deflection spins the inner gears, which are connected to a generator, and this generator converts the mechanical energy from the top plate deflecting into usable electricity that will be stored in a battery that sits outside the unit. This battery can be used to power la lights, gate signs, or any other electrical device. Uh, the original design of the Kineta plate currently generates 52 watts per vehicle, or 52 watts per hour per vehicle. Now, we, with first, further research and development, we will increase this energy output and modify the installation requirements to where it does not have to be installed in the ground. Now, there's a vast opportunity for this product to be implemented in a variety of applications. We have decided to focus on fast food restaurants because of the relatively consistent flow of traffic and because of the easy market penetration. There are over 16,000 fast food restaurants in Texas and over 26 million cars that drive in Texas. So you can imagine how much energy that can be generated using our device. Uh, two interests, we have talked to two interested establishments here in San Antonio. We spoke to Cassandra Dufresne from Starbucks headquarters and Suzanne Pearson from Bill Miller's headquarters. And they both expressed a lot of interest in using our product to lower their energy costs and promote a green image for their firms. <coughs> Here's a competitive matrix. Uh, we decided to analyze solar panels from Heliovolt, motion power for new energy technologies, and of course the Kineta Plate for new Renewable Revolution. Now in analyzing solar panels versus the Kineta Plate, you can see a vast difference in the uh, initial price, $25,000 versus $2,000. And while this is somewhat reflected in the energy output of the two devices, like I said before, with future research and development, we will increase this energy output drastically. Solar panels also have a lot of physical limitations, such as they do not work very well in cloud cover, in cold areas, or even in extreme heat. They also require a lot of installation uh, processes and require a large area to be placed. The Kineta plate, on the other hand, can operate 24 hours a day, is small in size, and all it needs is a ground and a car to run over it. Uh, the Motion Power is a similar product from New Energy Technologies in that it generates electricity as a vehicle runs over it. However, this company lacks the focus to put this product out on the market, and they have decided to focus on their solar product instead. This allows a huge window for the Kineta plate to step in and help these businesses uh, generate electricity to cut down on their high energy costs. <coughs> now here are some milestones to illustrate how exactly we will get the Kineta plate onto the market. In months one through three, we really want to focus on the branding. So in months one through three, we'll install the Kineta plate, the original design of the Kineta plate for free at a Starbucks or Bill Miller's location. Uh, during this time, we will monitor the results of the Kineta plate by monitoring customer reactions, the amount of cars that run over it, the amount of energy that's generated, and how much cost it actually saves that particular location. We will also use initial research and development funds to increase the energy output of the Kineta plate for version 2.0 and modify the installation requirements. We will advertise on vendor websites as well, such as Cisco, to gain awareness with our target market of fast food restaurants. 
In months four through 12, we will install the modified Kineta plate 2.0 at other Starbucks and Bill Miller's locations. We will uh, direct, use a, an experienced sales team to directly sell to fa other fast food restaurants by contacting their headquarters or uh, the individual franchise owners. We will continue marketing efforts by attending trade shows like Total Energy USA, which will actually debut in November in Houston. And we will, use, we will continue research and development to continue to improve the Kineta plate so that we can maintain our competitive advantage. In year two, we will expand statewide and implement the Kineta plate at other places of high volume traffic, such as uh, supermarket parking lots, parking garages, toll booths, and airports. And of course, we will continue research and development to improve the Kineta plate. Now, Renewable Revolution will generate revenue through two sources. We will sell the Kineta plate, which will come in a set of four, and with a 12 volt battery for now, for $2,000. We will also sell an optional five-year maintenance package for $500. In year one, we will sell 85 units by targeting uh, the Starbucks and Bill Miller's locations that have already expressed interest. There are over 100 locations of Bill Miller's in San Antonio and 60 of Starbucks. Uh, in year two, when we expand statewide, when we target uh, parking lots, airports, and toll booths, we will sell 200 units. And then in year three, when we sell 600 units, we will more thoroughly saturate that market. Now there are a couple of risks associated with Kineta Plate. One, that it is a new technology. However, there is such a broad market opportunity for this product that we believe that this will mitigate some of that risk. Uh, the high cost associated with the Kineta Plate can be mitigated through uh, capitalizing on economies of scale. And since the Kineta Plate is made using standardized parts, fabrication should be easy and cheap. Uh, for the maintenance, we will offer the optional maintenance packages so that our customers do not incur any extra costs when operating the Kineta plate. Uh, for the low efficiency and low energy output, we will improve that using research and development. And for funding, we will uh, apply for federal grants such as the Small Business Technology Transfer Program and uh, Axion Texas, which gives microloans to small startup businesses. Here's our income statement for years one through three. Um, as you can see, we make a profit in year two. Our break-even point is 87 units, and our break-even dollar amount is $215,000. Our total starting startup funding required is $300,000. With our member contribution of $60,000, the total amount needed from federal grants and from Axion Texas is $240,000. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? very low. However, uh, during the th first three months of our operation, we will uh, use research and development funds to come out with a Kinetic Plate 2.0 that will generate more electricity and give you more bang for your buck. Um, we estimate that uh, with the 2.0, we can at least cut down energy costs by at least a third. How much, how much does Starbucks use, how much electricity does Starbucks use for the year, and what percentage of this would that supply of, of that total electricity? really depends on how many cars drive through that particular location um, and what exactly they want to use the Kineta plate to power. Um, for instance, if you had a continuous flow of traffic uh, with a fully charged battery, you know, it could power their drive through menu and their parking lot lights, you know, all day. And what percentage of that is their overall electric expense? Um, I'm not real sure. Uh, I, can, I can estimate, you know, like a small business can be about $12,000 a year in electricity costs, so. Any other questions? Well, what about installation? I noticed in your business plan, you have estimating $700 per installation of one of the Kinetic plates. Uh, I know you're looking at an above ground model, so you wouldn't have to tear up the pavement. But even given that, are you going to tie into the electrical systems, given that you know there's, these are not going to be new construction sites in most cases, and you're going to want to be very careful about having wires strung across the parking lot? battery system on the outside so we could avoid having to deal with city infrastructure. Is that what your question was asking? So you're not going to tie back into the grid with CPS. It's only going to be self-supplying power to... 
Yes, at this rate, I think it's the best, the best method to go. Thank you. The next time will be CCP. This goes out, and I'll start pointing at you. Do a full slideshow, yes. My name is Michael Richard. I'm with ACPPC, Automatic Classification and Prediction of Prostate Cancer. I'm very excited to tell you about our patent pending software today that can help predict and classify in a Gleason score prostate cancer. To give you a brief industry overview, there are 230,000 new cases per year of prostate cancer, and there are 800,000 biopsies performed each year, so it's a, it's a sustainable market. And each prostate uh, case ranges between $5,000 to $20,000. And on average, this is about a $1.5 billion annual industry. Now, to give you an idea of what a biopsy is, basically you have to go in and into the body and actually take prostate samples with a needle. And this is done, and it takes about six to 12 prostate samples that are then stained and put on uh, slide tissues to analyze. Now, the current problem is, as already mentioned, over a million prostate biopsies performed each year. They're very costly. Um, on average, they're about 70% accurate. Biopsies do take time to analyze, and they can take up to two weeks for the result. So our solution is that the analysis of these biopsy slides is going to take under two minutes be 97.4% accurate, it gives the pathologist a 99% reduction of analysis time or 22-fold in their productivity. Now, it also provides a novel 3D dimensional grading system, and I'll address that later during the questioning period. Now, here are the current methods for detecting prostate cancer. Basically, a patient goes in to the doctor, and they take statistics on them. And by statistics, I mean if you're a male in your 40s to 50s, you are a prime candidate that is being suspected of uh, prostate cancer. The next step is then a PSA test. Now a PSA test is uh, where they take a needle and take some blood slides from you because the blood contains a protein known as the PSA. And they analyze this to see if it's a high level which occurs during prostate cancer. But this in itself is not foolproof. So the next step is then imaging where they go into the body with a camera and actually try and get a 3D image externally of the prostate. And this is very advanced, but it is not foolproof in itself. So the newest step is where our software comes in, in the biopsy histology analysis. Now to explain briefly, uh, the software does not replace the biopsy itself. It, it goes off of the biopsy. You need the tissue slides to be analyzed by a scanner in our software algorithm, which then uh, gives you a Gleason grading score. Now, a Gleason grading score on the low end, uh, there would be one, but we, don't, we didn't put that up here. The one is the more benign, the five is that it's aggressive and has probably affected the entire prostate or it's metastasizing into other tissues and or muscles. So, to give you uh, a little bit more detail about how this software works is that this is one of the biopsy tissue slides that has been stained, as you can see the purple dyes. It is then put under the high resolution scanner. It's scanned, it's blown up, and you can see the dots and the stains being absorbed in sort of strands. Now this is what the pathologist analyzed in order to determine whether the patient has prostate cancer. What our software does is that it analyzes it against a database of 150 to 1,000 slides of various Gleason scores that have been confirmed by five different pathologists for their Gleason grading, and then it maps out each uh, segment by segment on each tissue slide of the Gleason grade 
For instance, if the pathologist only saw grade three, he'd say, you're at grade three, but he missed grade five, which is extremely aggressive. So this can aid the pathologist in uh, classifying and predicting the prostate level. It also reduces the time and can increase it to 22-fold of productivity of analysis. So as I say, time is money. Now, to give you an idea of our market segmentation, there are 20,000 pathologists in the, in the United States alone, which is what we're targeting first. Uh, our primary market is pathology labs because you have small hospitals, cancer research centers, and large hospitals, and they all send them to a pathology lab, either on-site or off-site. We're targeting these pathology labs primarily. Uh, secondary market would be the universities with on-site locations, such as uh, Duke University, John Hopkins, and then tertiary market would be independent pathologists. To give you an idea of some of the hurdles we're facing, we are known as a class three device, which means that there's no prerequisite to base this software on. So we are the prime movers in the FDA regulatory for cancer detection software. Now, some of these uh, <coughs> FDA milestones have been uh, mapped out in the associated costs. On the low end, it will take 36 months from pre-market approval to the review, which can take between 30 days to two years. So we're looking at the, lo uh, the long end, five years for FDA approval. And the FDA approval costs are about $5.6 million. And in order to get this approved, we are outsourcing this step to Emergo Consulting, who has uh, worked with Fortune 500 companies and medical entrepreneurs to get devices onto the FDA market. To give you a little bit of uh, an idea of some of the risks that we're facing, we're really facing two big ones, the FDA rejection. Now, we have the patent and the software, so at that point, if the FDA rejects it, we will have to sell it, and we valued it after talking with um, medical entrepreneurs such as Craig Dion, Becky Cap, John Isaacs from John Hopkins University, and Dr. John Hardy in Austin at 3.8 million. Now, the reason that you would sell it for that much is if someone bought the patent, they could revise it and um, upgrade the algorithm and then push it to the FDA market again and maybe get it through. Now, assuming that it does go through, pathologists are skeptical that the software can replace the human eye in their work. Now, we're not trying to replace them. We're assisting them in this process. As I said, uh, 6 to 12 images for a pathologist to analyze takes, on average, about 45 minutes. The software, with research and development, can do it in, tw in two minutes. Excuse me. So that's a 22-fold of their time. Uh, pathologist, on average, makes about $150 an hour. So after calculating it, we would license it for $450,000 a year to each pathology lab, but we look to be acquired after FDA approval by companies uh, such as Quest Diagnostic, Paracel, and uh, some Johnson & Johnson companies. Now, to give you an idea of our expenses, in total from pre-market to uh, post-market uh, for FDA approval, we're looking at about $7.6 million for investment. However, the software at that point with the FDA approval, uh, by year 2022, it has been estimated to be at $300 million. And this uh, number we got by consulting with medical entrepreneurs that I have previously mentioned. So at this time, I would ask my team to come up and help me answer any questions that y'all have for me. Um, having talked with Emergo Consulting, with the preclinical, they assist you all the way through with their medical professionals and their legal team, and all the fees include the clinical expenses and the uh, regulations, making sure that they are abiding by all the laws. So that risk would be mitigated as far as after it goes to the market, um, we would be acquired, and any liability at that point would then be negotiated with them. With the acquirer? Yes. Uh, that would be Quest, Quest Diagnostic primarily.
So uh, initially, when we started this patent, we had uh, 150 biopsy images, and we get the classification rate of 97.4.5. Out of the out of 150, they, they belong to 50 images were from grade three, 50 from grade four, and 50 from grade five, and we got 97 percent. Uh, we compared this to other existing systems that weren't really put into practice, but compared to our analysis, we got 97. They were getting about 70 to 75. So the size of the sample is 150 biopsy images as for now. And once we get it started, we can go to thousands of biopsy images. Part of my question is, you got this sample that you base the algorithm on. Yes. Are you then testing the very same sample to see if you're coming up with realistic? Yes. Okay, but you haven't yet tested on brand new samples, so to speak. No, actually, the system takes this sample as a training. They train the system and to, to get these features that we need to, to get to decide on the cancer grade. And based on that, we come up with a grade and match this with the pathology. We've been having pathologists to review our samples and classification accuracy with three pathologists, and we take the most common opinion among those to confirm that the result is accurate. One more sub-question. Yeah. Sub -question. Does the grid size matter for that? I, I saw kind of 9 or 4.5. Well, yeah, the local windows, yeah, we do. We have specification. The local windows are around 250 by 250 pixels using this uh, scanner. Good, thank you. The next comment will be charge disk. My name is Joshua Vidar, and along with my team, uh, Ashley Carter, Marcelo Villarreal, Andrew Pena, and our chief engineer, Rosemary Gutierrez, we are here to introduce to you today an opportunity that's growing as we speak. An opportunity that's growing at a global rate of 7.4% compounded annually, annually each year. This market is the e-bike market. An e-bike, uh, just to give you quick little concept of it, is a bicycle uh, that has an electric motor and electric battery implemented onto it. Our opportunity isn't in the e-bicycle itself, but rather a device that can be mated to the e-bicycle to make it 80, up to 88% more efficient and give the cyclists opportunities to charge electronic, device, uh, electronic devices through USB capabilities. Now, our, this opportunity the e-bike market uh, has grown. From 1990 to 2011, a total of 120 million units have been sold. It's forecasted in 2018 to reach 47 million units in that year alone. So our solution is ChargeDisc. What ChargeDisc is, is it's a magnetic generator that utilizes a new magnet uh, that's been recently introduced to the market, neodymium. How it works is this magnet Half of the, uh, the magnets will be placed on the spokes of the wheel. The straighter coils, which are in the center between the magnets made of copper, will be placed on the structure, the frame of the wheel, making it stationary. Now, as the bike moves and the wheels rotate, the neodymium magnets will cross over these coils, creating magnetic energy. This magnetic energy is then captured and transferred to our three-phase circuit where it is then converted to a electrical energy that can be transferred back to the battery, thus recharging the battery while the bicycle is in motion. Also, at this three-phase circuit, where this is where the USB uh, ports will be for the bike to allow the cyclist to charge whatever electronics they choose. This is our forecasted industry growth. We looked at where the most potential was for e-bikes uh, for our charge this to be distributed through, throughout the world. We saw that in every country across the globe, bike sales, e-bike sales have grown drastically. So we looked at where we could attack all of these countries. What we found in our research is that our greatest opportunity is in the Chinese market. Approximately 1,400 e-bicycle manufacturers make up 89% of the e-bike e-bikes e produced each year. 
what we find, here's a little demonstration, or graphics of how many e-bikes are made compared to automotives and all other automobiles in China alone. How we look to reach these 1,400 manufacturers is our Interbike Trade Show. Uh, it's this September 19th through the 21st. Uh, we're there, we'll have a booth with a fully developed product, uh, a fully developed prototype of our product. We're there, we can show over 26,000 plus attendees, including over 500 top journalists and manufacturers, as well as e-bike manufacturers, our product. We really look at connecting with those 1,400 manufacturers. And here's our plan. <coughs> Phase one, uh, we'll have prototype development as well as validation from Southwest Research Institute that our product does work and it does make the bicycle more efficient and offer the USB capabilities that we've stated before. Uh, we will refine our target market to a select uh, manufacturers within this 1,400 manufacturers where we believe that we'll have the most opportunity and potential. Uh, with phase two, we'll actually enter into the market having and done the trade show with Interbike, having hopefully reached out to manufacturers. We'll go over to China and perhaps do a physical demonstration and show them the results that we received from Southwest Research Institute. Um, what we're looking for in phase two is to sign a high volume contract, licensing contract with these manufacturers uh, to help increase uh, sales and revenue. By phase three, we'll look to have fully entered into the Chinese market where we can uh, expand our market, perhaps in Europe and other countries where e-bikes are becoming more, pop more and more popular. Also, in 2016, we will look at signing a uh, charge this project over to, our selling charge, uh, charge this product to our highest, uh, highest bid, highest competitor, or largest competitor with the highest bid. Um, at that point, we will either pursue other magnetic opportunities with these new neodymium magnetic technologies, or we will uh, perhaps sue or sell uh, mollusk engineering as a whole. The potential risk uh, with entering into China and our device is the threat of new entrants. We do realize we do have a new technology uh, with these neodymium magnets, and we, re we rely heavily on our IP technology as well as our standing as being a top leading firm uh, in the industry with charges. Um, and our inexperience. Uh, we do realize that we are uh, all college students having recently graduated, and we will rely heavily on our uh, advisors as well as our school to help pursue our goals and reach our sales in which we're looking for. This is an example of our working prototype showing that this technology does work. Charges, the technology does work. It is out there and the opportunity is endless. With Charges, what we look at doing is selling it to, or licensing it to manufacturers. Uh, the, char the disc itself, uh, when it's added to the bike, has a retail value of over, a perceived retail value of over $400. What we're looking at is collecting $30 for each unit that's put onto the bicycle. With that, what are we asking for? We're asking for $450,000 for a 40% stake in our company in order to bring charges to market within the next 12 months. I do want to thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, feel free to answer. Feel free. Yes, sir. Where does this fit in the assembly process for the e-bike manufacturer, and how does it change their assembly process? Uh, the, the disc itself is easy, uh, easily uh, Mateable to uh, the bike itself, so as far as putting it on, there's no special requirements or installation. Um, it's very simple. So it's assembly itself, there wouldn't be that many added steps. How did you come up with the name Mollusk Engineering? <laughs> that's a good question. We kinda, we have an engineer that's kind of out there. <laughs> <laughs> At least it's memorable. 
No, no hard feelings. Great. Thank you very much. And the final competitor today is going to be Lead Seek. Good afternoon, and we are Leak Seek Compressed Air Solutions. And first I'm going to talk about a compressor. And a compressor is a device that converts power into energy by compressing air, and it can be released in quick, from quick bursts. And compressors are used in power plants, service departments, and everyday homes. And they're used in power tools such as nail guns and drills. And the problems that we're facing right now with these air compressors are the drills in these pneumatic systems. Pneumatic system is pretty much an air compressor. The problem that we're facing is that we're, the United States we're spending about three to five billion dollars in energy costs through compressed air. And this is due to compressors constantly running and the increase in leaks. And the current uh, methods are inefficient right now. You can walk around, do your system, and you can spray soapy water or use an ultra ultrasonic sound detection uh, to find your leaks. And they're not very efficient and they give you uh, bad calculations. The leaks are unavoidable as well. And leaks will always appear in your, in your compressed systems. And this is due to faulty piping, uh, corrosion, and rust. And there's also an absent small business market. Uh, it, the penetration to this market can create into new industry. And on the graph, it shows that most of the costs are actually due to the energy usage of the compressor. This, the leaks cause the compressor to overwork, and the depreciation on them skyrockets. OK. Uh. Sorry. As a solution for this problem, what we can uh, do is uh, we will provide the system with a leak monitor that it's uh, going to fit in any kind of system, no matter how small it is or how big it is. And also, it's going to perform a, uh, a leak detection during off hours. And also, it will tell you how much leak you have and how much money you lose. Oops, sorry. We're also going to provide a service. And we're going to aim to lower your, your energy costs by eliminating your leaks as well. Uh, we're going to help companies save in profits and save, or increase profits and save in energy costs. And we're going to maintenance your, your system to ensure that leaks are fixed. We're also going to offer something similar to what our competitors do, which is offer the service only, where we charge you an hourly rate to go out and fix your compressor without without the device. Okay, if we look at the screen over here, first of all, there is no such a device that it's doing uh, a leak monitor right now on the market. But after the research, we find out that there is two other devices over here. One of them is called Extra Air, and the other one is called Isaac X Air. And all of these devices is actually monitoring the pressure uh, decay. If you're losing pressure, that's correlated to you have a leak. But actually, this is not true, because if you're losing pressure, you may be just using your tools. And even if you like detecting the leak during off hours with these pressure monitors, it will not gonna tell you how good or bad your leak because your leak's supposed to be as a part of your system volume. If your system volume, if your leak rate is like below your 10% of your system volume, you don't have to take any action on that. But if it's above that, that's when our device gonna tell you that you need to take an action and what is this action can be. And also another thing, another key term for our, uh, for our device is you can find out where is your leak exactly by isolating a part of your system and run a manual check on, on each time. And that way you're going to save all of these man hours that you can lose to find the leak. Next we're going to talk about our target market. And we're going to be, uh, we're going to be covering some, some small mechanic shops. Uh, they're always in constant use of their compressors. Next is our car dealerships. And about four out of the five dealerships that we spoke to said that they'd incorporate the idea into uh, their business. Vada Chevrolet actually 
uh, asked us to test run their product on their service department. Next, uh, we're going to be looking to get into franchises such as Pep Boys and Midas' service departments as well. Uh, we're not ruling out the, the possibility of being in larger manufacturers uh, such as HEB and Certifit, but we do want to educate them if they do not know about the, the, energy, the loss of energy costs that they, that they have. Next is our sales strategy, and for the first couple of years, or for the first year, we're going to be, the business students are going to be walking around from business to business selling them, or selling them on their uh, energy costs and how much they're losing. Uh, next, we'll, the next year we'll be attending trade shows. We want to attend the NADA trade show, uh, which is important to us because about two-thirds of the, of the top 125 dealership groups uh, appear there. And 33% of these people spend about seven hours on the floor, so we'll get a lot of time with them. We also want to provide an interactive website for our customers. That way they can go ahead and, and make appointments uh, for Salesforce and also make an appointment to fix your leaks. Okay, here we have a summary of our financials. With a startup funding of $450,000, we expect to break even within the third year. And also, we are in collateral giving investors 25% of equity. Here's some milestones. Um, we would like to finish our prototype by May of 2012. This is version one. The second version is actually going to incorporate a wireless adapter. This wireless adapter will allow us to communicate with the device through a mobile application that will be controlled by a technician at the certain plant. In 2013, and this would be in 2013. Um, 2014 is where we expect to use Midas and Pet Boys, uh, the franchises, as and expanding into expanding the markets throughout Texas. And then a year later, we expect to uh, expand nationwide. This is only going to be with the product. With our service, we are we're going to stay locally in Southern Texas. And for the future, we would like to be acquired by two different firms either McKinsey or Tsunami Compressed Air Solutions. McKinsey is based out of Bernie, Texas, and they have a really strong service industry, but yet no product. So therefore, we would like to, we feel that our leak-seek device would be a great asset to help them in their competitive advantage. With Tsunami, they are in the larger industry with larger compressors, where with more sophisticated devices, and they are not in the small business model. The small business market. Therefore, with our product, we feel we would broaden their customer base. And with that, we'd like to open the floor for questions. Chris, question over here. Well, the idea behind it was we believed we wanted to establish ourselves by trying to get into the market with building a name for ourselves, therefore being able to sell our cup or not, be acquired for a higher profit in the end. If we just go straight to them, we feel that we would not be able to generate a lot of money. So what we're going to do, a couple things logistically, we've been compiling the data in real time. I'm going to take the judges with me out of here for about 10 minutes to review the results. We will come back and announce best pitch, best plan, and best venture. 
along with the prizes. Please be reminded the university does require to actually receive money from us. You have to completely fill out a W-9, which includes your social. It is a requirement by law. If you do not have a social and are a foreign student, we have another form that you are supposed to fill out. So get all those forms back into Judith and we'll be able to go from there. So judges, if you wouldn't mind following me out here, everyone else stay put and I will pick up those forms. Well, first of all, uh, the scoring was really tight. Really tight, some phenomenal projects. Uh, Phenomenal products, great work on all the teams. And remember, you know, every team gets the funding for their prototypes, the budget that we gave them at the beginning of the semester. And uh, with Judith Kiddos, you can submit all those, so at least you're getting the money for that. You guys need to remember, for those of you who don't have jobs yet, who are seeking jobs, use this as one of your differentiators. Look what I did in my senior year. Look at the product we developed, look at the business plan we put together. Put yourself above the crowd when some other unmentionable Texas school graduates happen to show up in the same room as you. So we have the scores, we have the awards. However, I'm going to ask the judges, uh, if they don't mind, just to give you a quick bit of general feedback from what they saw today. And I've got certificates for each of them. So uh, James, I'm going to ask you to come up first. Where is James? Oh, there you are. So first of all, we got a nice certificate for you. Thank you very much. This is not the first time I've judged a competition like this. Um, I, I've done several on uh, the East Coast and on the West Coast, and I am amazed and surprised and enlightened that San Antonio and UTSA has this kind of talent. So first of all, I want to say that, and then um, secondly, uh, you all did a great job. Uh, I guess the advice that I'd give is when you get up here, talk like you're conversing to me out there. Out there, you guys did a great job of explaining the value proposition in a conversational tone. When you're doing a presentation or pitch, don't worry about it. Let it fly. Great job with everything. And you know what? Failure is a first step to success. So you'll never fall down if you fall forward. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to stay. I think on the same thing. I mean, just great to see all the talent up here. I bring a little bit different perspective that I do own several companies myself and have invested as an angel in several. So seeing how far you guys have come as a college project is phenomenal. It's just great to see so many entrepreneurs here in San Antonio. And hopefully we'll have a lot more. You think about all the new Rackspace millionaires we have here in town and all the other folks here who are uh, coming and migrating into Texas. We have a vibrant opportunity to be in a real entrepreneurial echo center. And uh, I'd like to just say to each of you guys, you know, thinking through the different questions that you can get hit with, all those possibilities that you want to be prepared to answer, uh, it's great to play devil's advocate. There needs to be a cynical person in every group to kind of challenge the wide-eyed optimism that everybody has when they have a product. So kind of finding somebody who can, can challenge you back, it can really lead to a lot of innovation. And I think someone would argue that the cynical person was the professor. So. <laughs> I'm asking you to come up next, please. I have a little bit different perspective. I spent the last well, about four or five years asking people for Don, like Don, for money. So <laughs> I, I believe me, I feel your pain. I know how hard it is to do this stuff. The only thing I'd leave you with is, as you're going through this, well, two things. One, remember you're not selling a technology, you're selling a solution. You're giving people an answer to something. The actual product you give them is just what's giving you the vehicle for that value. The second thing is, never assume you really know how the customer uses your product, because you may think it's used one way, you have to spend a lot of time watching your customers use your product, because you're going to see things you didn't expect. And then as, as a derivative of that, the value that they create may not be what you think it should be. A great job, everyone. These products are really intriguing, and your stories are intriguing, and everybody did 
a fantastic job. So congratulations. I guess um, as the lawyer, I would say one of the things that you can think about as part of your pitch and as far as part of like designing your product is what is the document, what is the agreement, how am I going to sell this, and what are the terms and conditions of that sale going to be, and is there anything that I can do to design my product so that it fits better into a contract that's going to get me more money and provide me with more liability protection. So just something to think about. Well, as the uh, the college professor, I guess I'm the cynic. Uh, I've uh, I've spent probably more time now in uh, academia than I have in, in the real world, like you, you folks are about ready to go into. Uh, however, I have spent some time in industry. Uh, probably the best bit of advice I can give you is, uh, I think it was touched on a little bit already, uh, know your customer, uh, listen to your customer. Um, uh, I've, I've heard some, uh, I probably learned the best thing about my products uh, when, it was out, when it was outside the industry about, you know, from the customer. They give you very good advice, they know your product, uh, Take what they tell you very seriously. If you do that, you will have a wonderful product. You'll be able to sell it. Derek. Yeah, great job, guys and gals. Uh, just a couple of things. I suppose the first thing is don't be afraid of the hard questions. If you get some questions that stump you, that's good. It shows you the possible holes in the plan, and it's better to learn those earlier before you spend a lot of time and money on it. But how to get on the right track and the wrong track. The second thing is more along the lines of uh, you know, branding. You know, as we were sitting back in this room trying to figure out, you know, which which were the topics we bought, trying to figure out who did what. You were left with a string of acronyms. You know, MSA, ABC, XYZ, and so I encourage you to give a little more thought to your brand. So when you've got some, some visual, some mental hook, that when you see your name, like, wow, yeah, that's the blood, that, those are blood types. Or, wow, that's the that's great of that. Instead of just kind of string initials. I know it's, it's of lesser importance than you know, getting the technology to work, getting the concept and stuff, but it's never less important when you're going to talk to investors. You want to stand out a bit. So I encourage you to give a little thought to that it. Otherwise, great job. Fantastic. <laughs> say that I know that we're going to have some supposed winners today, but every one of you were winners today. Because being an entrepreneur, in my mind, is the greatest thing in the world. It's more fun than anything else. I'd rather not be any attorney. <laughs> and right now, with all the unemployment out there, you have the opportunity to create your own employment as entrepreneurs. You can make the money you want to make. There are no losers here today. This is the best group I've seen in a long time. I appreciate every one of you. I want to uh, tag on what Rudy said a little bit. And uh, one of the things that I hope you appreciate about this group, uh, I went to UTSA a while ago, a long while ago. Not that long. I'm only 34. I can't do that long ago. Um, this, this wasn't a part of my degree plan. And I'll tell you what, right now, when I surround myself with uh, professionals in my industry, I sometimes feel a little bit like a freak. Like nobody quite identifies with me. I don't see financial limits as challenges. Somebody says, oh, that's going to cost us $12,000. I say, okay. And now what? Whereas everybody, oh, 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 oh. Right? everybody who goes out there to get a job, they see everything as a very finite number. This room, you're surrounded with some incredible peers that I hope you take that with you for the rest of your life. That, like Rudy said, you can make as much money as you decide that you want to make in business when you are in charge of your own destiny. So I want to tell you, number one, remember this. Not that college is the best time of your life. Everybody will tell you that. Right? 
but remember this group of peers. Um, there are other organizations out there like EO that you can surround yourself with other people that are like-minded in the market, but you really have to look for those like-minded individuals. The second thing uh, that I'd like to leave you with, sorry, is uh, some of you guys have created quite a mountain to climb. The biggest frustration I've ever experienced as an entrepreneur is it never goes as fast as you think it will go. You work and work and work to climb that mountain. And you turn around and it's like, man, I got somewhere. Oh boy. I mean, it's just a big mountain. And it just feels like, sometimes it feels like it takes forever. But then five years down the road, you look back and you're like, holy smokes, look at what I've done. Okay? So when you feel like you are stuck in mud and you're just spinning your wheels as hard as you can, you are. <laughs> And that's okay. It's part of the process. You have to go through the battles. And at the end of it, man, it's the most gratifying thing I think you'll ever experience. I love, like you, I love being an entrepreneur. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. also for uh, press release. Okay, Dr. Muffin, were, were there any other logistical things we have to announce? We're good. Best pitch, CPM. <laughs> Come on. I'm going to ask that both faculty advisors please come up for the picture as well. Faculty? Who is your faculty advisor? Uh, Johnson, come on! No, and your faculty advisor. Oh, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Justin, come on here. Yeah. <laughs> right, so, everybody on the team will be getting one of these engraved that says best pitch. So we'll get you all together for a photo up here in the middle. Somehow you're going to squeeze into two rows. And make sure you can be seen by this camera right down here. They like you good. Thank you very much. Best business plan, PCMR. So the winning teams will get engraved uh, plaques and be notified when your checks are available as well for the team and then the follow on with any of the startup companies working with Pop Smith and Derek will actually be the point of contact. Finally, best technology venture, ACCP.
<laughs> so everybody, congratulations on doing what no other undergrad UT system has done. We are UTSA, and we will see you at graduation. Congratulations, Paul.